there's been a major shift towards the digitization of trade finance. And HSBC has been leading this transition, unlocking the potential of blockchain technology and realizing the benefits of blockchain-enabled transactions to modernize trade finance. Joining us to discuss this issue is Vine Mendoza, who's Global Head of Product and Propositions, Global Trade and Receivables Finance at HSBC. Welcome to Cybos TV. Let's get straight into it. Blockchain has been heralded as the savior of trade finance for several years now, but what's preventing one or more of these systems from becoming the go-to platform? So I think one of the reasons why blockchain, or I'd rather use the technical phrase, which is distributed ledger technology, is helping bring trade together, is it helps get the different stakeholders that are involved in a trade transaction on a, si on a single platform or an application. So that's the shipping industry, the logistics, the freight forwarders, the banks, and the buyers and the sellers. This has always been a challenge in the past because no one wanted to share their data into a common database that could be vulnerable or could be monetized by, by a for-profit firm. What Distributed Ledger does, it allows you to exchange information between these different players without having to part with your data or exchange your data. And that really has been the potential of Distributed Ledger. In terms of it getting to scale, so there have been some really good initiatives so far where we had live transactions and we proved the value of Distributed Ledger towards trade and trade finance. But in terms of taking it to the next level, we're gonna have to achieve interoperability or get these different platforms that you reference to talk to one another. That's, that's really an imperative. Well, you've actually just answered the question I was going to put to you about platform interoperability. I mean, is that the answer? That, that's the holy grail. So <laughs> even before that, I think the interoperability aspect is a bit more technology oriented. I think if we take a step back, we first need to agree the business standards. So we need to agree if we're talking between multiple banks or we're talking between shipping industries, we're talking different trade terms, letters of credit, open account, what's the minimum business standards that we should all follow? And for that, the ICC or, or, or certain supranational bodies need to issue certain guidances out there which folks could then follow. After that, the technology interoperability is something that's been achieved in different industries. If you see media content, you see telecom, you see the internet, they work on different protocols, they're all able to talk to each other. So I don't think the tech is the challenge. I think the bigger challenge is can we get business standards that mm -hmm. different international national countries, shipping industries, banks, insurers, customs, boats, all decide to follow. That's, that's really the challenge. Right. Uniformity. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Challenges aside, what are the most successful use cases that you've seen to date? Sure. So I think, uh, I think we tend to jump straight into blockchain and distributed ledger, but actually there have been some really good successes even before that. So one is clients starting to use digital channels. So these are corporates who start using basic things like it, you know, net features, going onto UIs, uh, getting their ERP systems or accounting systems to talk to the banking systems directly or using even things like mobile apps. So things like that have been really successful. From our perspective at HSBC, our client said, I'd like to know where my trade transaction is. So we give them a very simple mobile app which allows them to see where the transaction is. The next thing they said is, well, I want to know where the documents linked to this transaction is. And so now we're working with some of our logistics firms. We give them, actually can tell them where the physical documents or the shipping documents related to a transaction is. And then they came back and said, we want a third dimension. I want to know where the container where my goods are, tell me where it is in the world. So we could actually go through an API firm, uh, which actually gives us an Internet of Things feed, and actually tell you where the container is and when, how long it's going to take to reach the next port. So that's a really simple and a basic hygiene case, self-service on demand. But I think one of the most successful higher profile use cases has been what we've done with uh, Project Waltron, which is really around letters of credit, where effectively using a completely digital platform, we've gotten rid of all the paper involved in a trade transaction. And for a seller or an exporter, it means they get paid something like five to 10 days faster than what it normally takes. And so that helps with obviously working capital efficiency, but also it helps them sell more because if a transaction concludes faster, they're allowed to then put more soya or more shipment to the buyer. They can sell faster. So 
it's not all about efficiency and growing people. It's actually being able to trade more and, in fact, get the velocity of trade going. Mm. And yet, despite this, we've seen a limited consolidation in the market so far. So do you think that trend is likely to continue effectively? Are you backing the right horse? Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we... a betting uh, analogy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think with a uh, representative of our franchise at HSBC, because we, we go from uh, uh, different sizes of clientele and corporates uh, uh, and in different industries and different geographies, so based on that, we've, we've tried to be part of consortiums of platforms that cater to different needs. So whether that's open account, whether that's traditional trade, whether that's specifically for small and medium enterprises and the like. Uh, I, I do think there's been a little bit consolidation. So we've had a few, you know, a few firms, a few platforms coming together. I, uh, I definitely don't think the answer is there going to be one. I'm pretty sure there won't be only one. Mm. But therefore, the interoperability challenge uh, needs to be really cracked and, 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 and needs to be got to. But I think also in terms of um, adoption and scale to be able to get to that level, I think the legal framework uh, also needs to keep up. So we talked about you know, a uh, completely paperless transaction on Waltron. That used something known as an electronic bill of lading, which is, which is gaining exponentially. Uh, I was talking to one of the, at Cybos right, uh, uh, earlier today, to one of the electronic bill of lading title registry companies, and they've said they've seen a doubling in volumes, right? So again, it's a quick win. It's a paperless one, but to get it to the next degree of scale, we need something known as an Electronic Negotiable Instruments Act. So we need regulators to come out and put out a law that will help smaller companies adopt some of this digitization. Are banks feeling uh, fatigue somewhat over blockchain prototyping, do you think? Sure. So I, I do think, to be uh, perfectly honest, I think when blockchain came to the fore, it was almost a solution looking for a problem to solve. I yeah. think, I think, I think we've, 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 we've now looked at actually what is the problem, which is too much of paper, you know, trust issues, uh, the time and speed involved, it's just too slow. I mean, today, ships move faster than the trade documents move between the banks, right? So uh, we, we needed to solve for those problems. I think we all genuinely believe the digitization of trade is has to happen. I mean, in an environment where clients are working in, 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 in a very difficult geopolitical environments where they need to be able to kind of make sure that their trade is happening in a simpler, safer, faster manner. I think we owe it to, to, to our customers to really help make that happen. And um, I'm not so kind of specifically about blockchain, but generally the digitization of trade and the agenda we have, I think collectively it's not just the banks, but the regulators this time around, the shipping industry, the logistics, everybody knows we need to get together to solve this problem. And if I just go back to the kind of humble container that you see uh, you know, on the roads or you see them in the ship, uh, just think about that standardization of how everybody was able to agree to the size of the container, you know, what, how would it be transported, the roads, the ships, how the ships were designed, and how uh, all the warehouses, the ports, et cetera, accepted it. It was a long journey, mm. and we take it for granted now. You see anywhere in the world you can go, you'll see the same size container. But if you think how long that process of standardization would have taken, I think we're still, we're still, uh, we're still, still it, getting there. It's basically there. stepping up to the plate. It's logistics, but in a completely new way. In a completely different way, and I think that's one of the things where um, uh, um, we do need to be patient. A lot of the technologists, though, have pointed out that, that some of the problems are not really technology issues with either blockchain, distributed ledger, or any other technology. It's some of these business standards that the industry needs to gather, uh, needs to get together and, and, and crack their heads on it. And so we're really looking for ICC, WTO, and some of these international bodies to set those standards. I think the technology is, is definitely uh, the lesser of the challenge. Mm. And, and let's broaden this out a bit, because you know we're talking about these different institutions which are involved in this, the line which, which you operate at, but how important is it for them to actually understand the operational realities to make a blockchain network succeed? Because it doesn't just happen. Yeah, so it, it is a really good question because when we talk to clients, um, many of them, like we were a few years ago, are for the first time understanding what is distributed ledger or blockchain, right? What does it really entail? What, you're always so used to having a software that has a database in the center to think about a software application now where we're all exchanging information, our own nodes, is quite a transformational journey. And so we've had discussions with some of our clients where we presented to their boards, to their CEOs, to explain the technology, how it works, what the security around it is, and then start the next process of the implementation. Now that's where it can get quite technical because they do need to host nodes to join these blockchain environments. So some of the banks involved do have to have 
implementation team. So we have advisors who help our clients say, that's how you get onboarded onto the platform, that's how the data would be shared with the platform, and there's a fair, fair journey to be had out there. One of the big learnings we had specific to letters of credit especially is, we decided to follow the existing rule book that exists, which is uniform customs and practices mm -hmm. for LCs. And, and when we were co-creating the solution with our clients, they told us, do not invent a new rule book and try to reinvent trade completely. Follow things that people understand, but digitize it, right? So do it in a way that's easier. Because if you try to invent a rule book, trying to get all the countries in the world and everybody to understand that has its own challenges. So we've followed the new same rule book. So to that extent, we've tried to keep the entry barriers as low as possible. Mm. Uh, but to your point, I think, uh, you know, at Cybos, we're meeting several banks here, and one of their challenges is how can you make sure we can join these platforms at the minimal cost possible? So we're working with tech partners to see if there's a trade finance applications that are sold to different banks. Can they have almost plug-and-play solutions? Like, can we come in and almost just plug into a Project Waltron, or can we plug into a trade information network? Can we plug into Trade? Any one of these without having to spend millions of dollars in research and development. That's the way we'll get scale. Otherwise, we'd struggle. Okay. Now, banks and fintechs alike have been increasingly opening up their products and services with APIs uh, and banking marketplaces. Does the adoption of APIs increase the sharing information across the trade finance ecosystem, and, and do they provide greater opportunities for increased collaboration? Absolutely. And I think, you know, if we keep always keep our client in mind, our the customer who's either a buyer or seller in trade and at the heart of the transaction, I think the use of APIs to their benefit is something that's really going to help them. And, and one of the examples we've done is working with a couple of our partner banks. Uh, we, for example, developed an API solution where if we reissue a guarantee anywhere in our network on behalf of their client, we actually, through an API, feed back a status to them, which they make available immediately to their corporate line on their website. So that's where APIs allow for this almost real-time flow of data across two entities and give you that transparency and visibility. So our, the clients at our partner banks would normally not have known when HSBC finally issued a guarantee to the end beneficiary because they're completely different, to ba different banks. But with the use of APIs now, we can feed that information back to them and they can tell their client, hey, by the way, your guarantee has now finally received the beneficiary. So that's just one simple, very easy example, but powerful, of how APIs can kind of make the world really come together and converge. Uh, so I certainly think use of APIs and sharing of data will help with, with similar examples. I think the other way, one we always talk about is uh, there is a massive trade finance gap for these small and medium enterprises, especially in the emerging markets, right? So the Asia Development Bank quotes that figure almost 1.5, 1.6 trillion dollars. And, and the only way we can start lending to that smaller catchment of customers, if we had better visibility of data, if we knew, you know, what, what had they purchased, where were they, you know, who were they selling to, when did the cash come in, what was the shipping information, where are the goods? If we had all of that data, we'd be able to look at that data and make almost real-time lending decisions and be able to advance funds faster to them, which is today quite an onerous process, takes weeks if not months often. Uh, and that's something where I think with, with more API, more data visibility, we can actually make that happen and really help tangibly uh, you know, uplift societies by kind of getting trade finance out there. I mean, this is really interesting stuff and I'd love to continue the conversation, but sadly, time as ever goes against us. But look, Vinay Mendonca, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Cybos TV. Thank Have you. a great Cybos week. It's been absolutely marvelous, really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Cheers. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you.